بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه. All praises due to Allah and may the finest peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa taala be upon His prophets and messengers. So, dear respected brothers and sisters, I welcome you all with the greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala be upon you all. So, uh, first and foremost, I would like to. Um, Congratulate you all for attending this um, event, the Tri-State Dawah Weekend, which is intended to be a weekend of knowledge exchange, of benefit, of interaction, and so on, for the purpose of conveying the message of Islam to the wider community. And we'll talk about why Dawah is important in this course. We'll uh, build on each other's confidence together as a whole, and the goal ultimately is to empower you all to go out there and convey the message of Islam to our non-Muslim acquaintances, whether that be the general public at large, whether that be perhaps your close friend, uh, maybe your Jewish or Christian friend, atheist, agnostic, Hindu, Sikh, whomever, maybe an Islamophobe, and, um, or maybe just someone at work, or even a family member for some reverts who perhaps had uh, members of the family who are not Muslim and they wish to invite them to Islam. So as you all know, Dawah has a lot of branches. As I mentioned yesterday in the teaser, Dawah is a tree. And within this tree you have different branches. And what we're going to do today is we're going to branch off a specific field or a specific area in the overall scope of Dawah. And the field that we'll be covering today is mostly confidence, empowerment, and strategic approaches in Dawah. We are going to get into some technicalities. So we're going to present a method which is like a map to guide you to have an effective conversation with anyone, anyone whom you, whom you may have a conversation with. And the, the, the real profound benefit of this specific course is it will enable you, inshallah ta'ala, to communicate with anyone of any background, of any faith. Whether it's someone who hates Islam or loves Islam, it's irrelevant. And that's why this is a really good approach, inshallah. But we have to go through some uh, introductory, uh, necessary introduc inter introductory um, steps first for us to proceed with the actual approach. We're going to make this, inshallah, a dialogue session. It's not going to be necessarily monologue, so you can expect every and each one of you to be involved and please do get involved, please participate. Uh, it's very essential that you're involved in, in, in the uh, dialogue because that's how right, we ultimately gain our skills and enhance ourselves in terms of communication skills and whatnot. So that's going to be inshallah something expected for the course and I think that's where the utmost benefit will be. More so, we're going to do some role playing skits. So we're going to have some of you come up here where we're actually going to engage in conversation and kind of like role play and act it out real scenarios that happen out there in the Dawah field. So, the teams that we work with as a whole include Ayura, which is a UK-based organization, Why Islam, as many of you guys may know. We have um, a number of other organizations that are very prominent in the Dawah field. And with all these Dawah organizations, there's one thing in common. They set up Dawah boots in designated locations. And what do they do? They convey the message of Islam. So the question here, and I think this is the most important fundamental question for us to ask is, do we feel prepared, encouraged, motivated, and confident in going out and having a conversation with our uh, you know, fellow uh, American citizens? Do we feel comfortable with this? So do we feel confident? Do we feel that if someone came up to us and asked us perhaps a difficult question, right, or a controversial question today, uh, or just a question that is taboo, like so, people don't really want to talk about it or address it, our, how, how confident do we feel? Do, do we feel like we can actually engage with a person and have a conversation and articulate the message of Islam properly? Or do we feel hesitant? Do we feel scared? Do we feel inferior? So I think this is, um, this is the goal of, of the course ultimately, is to empower us and give us that confidence to just stand up and have a conversation, a good conversation with our non-Muslim friends, inshallah. So that said, this is a Dawah Training Level 1 course. And before we proceed, we need to ask this question. 
So why do we come on a training course to learn how to give da'wah? I think this is also a preliminary question for us to ask. And the reason being is because for everything that we do in life, there has to be purpose and reason behind it, right? So we got up this morning, you know, when we wore our shoes, obviously we don't realize, I mean subconsciously it's there, but the purpose of our shoes essentially is to guard us in some kind of way when we go outside. But everything has a purpose. Every single thing in life that we do has a purpose. So what do you guys think the purpose um, is of this in terms of coming on a training course to learn how to give it out? Just to kind of put it out there. To make sure we convey the message properly in a manner that befits the religion. Okay. Yeah. And why, why do you feel that's important, just to add on? Um, so, um, a friend of mine put this in a way, like, for example, um, he, he, the way he put it is, like, say, for example, like, you have, like, a, um, someone who's, like, very hungry, right? Yeah. And they're, they're super hungry, but you, pre, you, and you have, like, food. But you give them food. Um, you have you give you present food on a garbage can lid, and would they take the food? Even though the food they're hungry, they won't take the food. Even though you're presenting it on a garbage can lid, mm. whereas they would take the food if you present it on a, like a silver platter. Mm. So if you're presenting it on a garbage can lid, they won't right. take the food. So you have to be able to present it in a way where they'll be able to take it. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So the analogy you're given, you're giving a similar yeah. to that. Well, here's a version of Islam, mm -hmm. and here's the proper version of Islam and yeah. we want to be able we want to be able to uh, we want to equip ourselves with the tools so that we can present the Islam on the silver plate right correct did you have something to add with? I was just going to say that I really like the word used properly because a lot of people have like an improper judgment of what Islam is so it's our duty to give them a proper judgment of it excellent point right so people have a misjudgment of Islam misrepresentation so for us to be here and attend this Dawah training course would enable us to not only ourselves understand Islam properly, but to be able to convey that image of Islam properly to others. Excellent. So, that said, here are some of the course objectives. So, first and foremost, we're going to talk about why Dawah is part of our everyday life. This is something that I myself, over time, came to realize that Dawah is really something that is part of our everyday life. In fact, it self-defines you, and we'll talk about that later. We're going to go through, as I mentioned, an effective map as to how to give da'wah. So, we know today there are many different ways to give da'wah. Many different ways. And just to give you a quick few examples, right? So you're talking with uh, your Christian friend. You're having a conversation with your Christian friend, and your Christian friend comes up to you and says, hey, so i kind of been reading your Quran, bro, and there's just some things in, in the Quran that, that are kind of bothering me, you know? Why does it say to, you know, beat your wife? or something like that, right? And as mentioned in Surah Nisa. So they'll come and, and, and they'll question this, or they'll question like uh, some of the verses, the explicit verses, for example, in Surah Tawbah chapter 9, where it says, uh, you know, slay the unbelievers wherever you see them, and they'll take it out of context. But anyway, they'll present this to you. So, unfortunately, the Muslim stance today, what we find popular in the Dawah field, is they get defensive, and sometimes they get offended. And what they'll respond with is a, a statement like this. They'll say, how can you even say something like this? How can you speak about what's mentioned in my Quran when your own Old Testament in Leviticus and Exodus and whatnot, it talks about beheadings and it talks about this and that and this. You know what I mean? So this, this obviously it doesn't get you far, right, in terms of da'wah. I mean, what is our end goal when it comes to da'wah? It's to convey the message of Islam to that person with compassion. You know, to deal with that person on a personal level and to invite them to Islamic monotheism. So what you're doing there doesn't seem too inviting. It's actually quite defensive and maybe even offensive to the person. And so there are many approaches today that are used in the Dawah field. Another one, I'm, I'm just highlighting a few mistakes that exist. By the way, the one that I just mentioned right now in philosophy is called the two quoque fallacy. What does that mean? It means it's like the, you know, like you're saying that kind of fallacy. Like how can you say that, you know, when... It's like, it's basically a fallacious uh, type of reasoning, which is not uh, a way that a Muslim, a Muslim should conduct their uh, type of reasoning. So this is just one example. Another example, for example, could be what Shef had mentioned yesterday, for any of you who were there yesterday, about the scientific miracles in the Quran, right? Very popular uh, phenomena today, very popular approach that many du'at, even myself, in the past have used in my younger age. And one thing we love, we love to do when we convey the message of Islam 
is speak about the scientific miracles of the Quran. You know, the scientific, uh, the Quran mentions scientific miracles and facts that were mentioned over 1400 years ago. For example, the process of embryology, mountains as pegs, you know, all these like, uh, what we think of as scientific miracles in the Quran. But when we dig deep into the philosophical nature of science, we realize that philosophically speaking, speaking and even Islamically, you can't say that there is science in the Quran. Why? Because science is something that changes. It's a beautiful tool. We love it as Muslims. In fact, one of the first uh, founders, or, or one of the co-founders of the uh, scientific method was uh, Ibn Haytham, who was a Muslim himself. So we love science. We have no problem. But to take science and now apply it to theology, to apply it to the Quranic discourse, is problematic because you're taking something that's man-made, a man-made tool, science is a man-made tool, and you're applying it to the Quran, and that's very problematic. We're going to talk about that a little bit more um, down the line, inshallah. But we'll talk about the, the better approaches as to how to give that one. But science changes. And so, a hundred years ago, for example, people believed that the world was steady state, meaning that, um, you know, there was, there was never a first cause to the universe. Today we have a Big Bang model. So you see how science changed? But back then, what, did, what were the Muslims supposed to say? Back then, they believed in a steady state model. So were they supposed to just go with Einstein's theory of steady state uh, of relativity? Or... Or, or say, no, well, science is limited, it's a tool, it changes over time, and I'm going to believe in the Quran because the Quran is absolute, it doesn't change, it's a divine word from Allah. So these are some of the um, mistakes that occur today, and that's why, inshallah, we're going to go through this effective map. But I think the effective map that we're going to present today is most helpful when it comes to the misconceptions. So someone comes up to you and asks you about the Prophet uh, marriage to Aisha radiallahu Someone comes up to you and asks you about uh, terrorism, or jihad, or any of those like controversial issues today are Sharia law, or you name it, right? All of these misconceptions that people have of Islam. The effective method we're providing today that you guys will learn will help most in those kind of situations. They deal uh, profoundly with, with those issues. Okay. Thirdly, in terms of course obje objectives, we want to gain the confidence to talk to anyone about Islam, and I kind of high highlighted that in the beginning. So we want to all be able to stand up and have an open conversation with a person and the way we're going to build on confidence is obviously through some of the lecturing, inshallah, and things that I'll present, but also practice. So, you know, as the course uh, progresses throughout the day, we'll have you guys, you know, actually team up. And, you know, one person will play the Muslim, one will play the non-Muslim, and we'll engage that way, inshallah. That includes empowerment also. So empowerment to show the beauty of Islam. Islam is a beautiful religion. We believe Islam is haq, is the truth. We believe Islam is the first religion that was given to mankind since the time of Adam alayhi salam and it's beautiful, its teachings are beautiful right, the Prophet sallallahu and his teachings are also very beautiful and we need to be able to articulate that and show people the actual true representation of Islam in a beautiful manner then we are going to also um, develop empathetic intelligence it's an interesting term so back then you know, there was never this thing called empathetic intelligence. It's always just been IQ, right? Like your intelligence level. But there's never been any empathetic intelligent type discussion. Except recently. In the 1980s, there was um, uh, a famous guy. He coined this term, empathetic intelligence, meaning EI, or standing for EI. And what empathetic intelligence is, is how intelligent are you empathetically? So that means when you speak to a person, how much empathy do you have for a person? Like how much can you realize this person in front of you is desperately in need of guidance? Or perhaps has a personal experience. Maybe their father died when they were younger and that's why they, they're atheists today. So to be empathetic. And what's interesting is the Prophet as I'll discuss later, was of the highest, of the highest EI out there in historical, um, you know, in historical background, uh, in whether it's Judeo-Christian tradition or Islamic tradition, EI was something that the Prophet ﷺ had at a very high degree. He was very empathetic to everyone, including his own enemies. Whether it, it, was, it was friends, companions, enemies, family, he had very high EI. And we see that in his seerah, we see that in the examples of his life and how he dealt with people. And we can discuss some of uh, those um, later inshallah. So developing EI is important because we as du'at, uh, as potential du'at, we need to be able to not just rationalize with people and present the rational foundations of Islam, but we also need to empathize 
with the creation. When we empathize with the creation, we can draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to do so in the Quranic discourse. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that if you truly love for your own brother or sister in humanity, and now he says an-nas, meaning a general humanity, then obviously, I mean, you can't be a true believer unless you love for your brother or sister, you love for your own self. So we want to have this um, EI, inshallah, empathetic intelligence. Next would be to develop conscious awareness of others. This is pretty tied to the EI. So again, when you're conscious of the person, have awareness of them, their background, their experiences, where did they come from, where are they going now, why do they believe what they believe in, what, right? Like what led them to their current belief? Why is this person agnostic? Why is this person in questioning, the, questioning the existence of God? Or why is this person completely denying God, right? Or why is this person worshiping a prophet of Allah, i.e. Isa, right? So all of these things, like what led a person to their current worldview? Developing sincerity in da'wah. Sincerity in da'wah is important. It's important, in fact, in any Islamic matter. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that the, one of the hidden shirks is called